Thank you. That was quite an introduction. Um, I think it's the best one I've ever had. Um, thank you, Hamburg, for the warm greeting. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, RGA and what it's doing in the next uh, nine years. And um, in order to do that, oops. Went black. This is black. Oh. Okay. Great. A high tech. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about change. I think um, what I found is um, I, I actually embrace change, but I, I don't like it any more than anybody else. It's very disruptive. Um, but it's actually very um, important also uh, that, that we change because. Um, there's never been more disruption in our industry. Um, it's, it's become not just difficult, it's become more and more difficult than it's ever been in the past because everything seems to be so much more complex. Um, starting in 1977 with my brother Richard, um, which uh, created the name um, R. Greenberg Associates, which subsequently became RGA, we were really looking at print advertising and how to put it into motion. Uh, and we were very interested in uh, design. So um, uh, design, um, moving pictures by design became our trademark. Um, I've always also been very interested in technology. And in the early years, um, I saw the computer as something that could really assist the production process and integrated it through everything that we do. My brother and I listened to a lot of Bob Dylan, John Cage, and we're really influenced by uh, Sal Bass, and, as well as Charles Eames and uh, Paul Rand. Those were the main influences. I had a little bit more hair then. Um, Superman really launched us into a, um, a business around um, uh, feature films. And over the course of the next many years, we worked on 400 plus features. Um, we wound up designing a lot of equipment, um, which now has all been, um, it's all able to be done on a laptop. And it's why I got out of the business, is because I saw the future of commoditization. The types of work that we were doing at the time um, were, were, was, was um, really reflective of the time and the technologies back then. Um, a lot of what we introduced was the idea of dual pin registration so that we could do really uh, different types of uh, feature projects. We were competitive with George Lucas's company and the differences uh, for experimentation is that we were working also in television which was 525, 600, 600 and 25 lines of resolution where features were about 2,000. We worked in both. In 86, actually before that, I brought the entire group that worked on the movie Tron to RGA, and we also switched from um, VMS Fortran as a language to uh, Unix. We, I bought a license directly from Bill Joy, who later founded uh, Sun Microsystems. And it was the very beginnings of collaboration uh, and integration. And I think people still don't really understand the concept of integration. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But in terms of the most collaborative medium that's creative, I think that it's the feature film business. Because if you look at the end crawl of a big uh, visual effects movie, you might have 2,000, 3,000 people all working on something together. Um, I was very influenced uh, by uh, the Bauhaus and um, by German design. And um, the less is more concept uh, really is about reductionist thinking. And the sum is greater than the individual parts is really uh, connected to the idea of collaboration. Um, a Gropius house. And our office in New York, um, I tried to do a reference to 
the Bauhaus when I built the offices. Um, what we were doing for the first time back in those years was integrating film, video, and computer graphics under one roof. Um, it created a lot of tension. People didn't like the changes. Um, they fought particularly the idea of video. They thought that it was uh, not as good as film. And um, I think they still have that ongoing fight now. In 95 to 2003, we worked on creating um, a new uh, model for a, um, uh, an advertising agency. And the disruption that I looked at in 93 was really um, uh, uh, things that were caused by these three guys. I specifically looked at Ogilvy, Leo Burnett, and the Birnbach part, or the B of DDB, and tried to understand how were they able to grow these very large global networks. And it's pretty simple. The disruption during that period of time of Mad Men years was really TV. But um, what I thought I could build an agency around was the disruption that would be caused by the internet. I wasn't able to, in 93, 94, see mobile and its importance or social media, but those have come along for the ride. I think the next really big disruptor, by the way, if anybody tracks those sorts of things, is going to be 3D printing. And some people think that that's a one-trick pony, just like they thought that uh, the internet and computer graphics were as well. But it's going to be very big. And it's sort of looping back around to TV becoming much more relevant now. I actually think that the thing that's in trouble is the studio system and feature films but not uh, television, because television is becoming really um, able to be customized in so many ways, uh, viewing it um, as a non-appointment situation anytime, anywhere, any, any how you want to, um, is, is making it extremely relevant again. So we're, we just opened in Los Angeles, as an example, around the idea of drawing in the talent from uh, content production, which is really centered there. And we opened in Austin, Texas, around social media and people who really understand how to write uh, code for um, Android and, and uh, iPhone. So we created this interactive agency. Um, and this is a funny picture. I never thought it would uh, change as much as it has, where um, we were sitting behind these very large cathode ray tubes um, back in the day. Um, and the work that we did um, was to really try to add motion once again and design to uh, the interactive business. Um, from 2004 to 2012, we worked on a model of um, a creatively driven agency that would also not differentiate between creativity uh, that's uh, visual designers and uh, writers, but um, also technologists. And we think of them as the same. Um, and the idea that we have to be global is something that um, uh, we now have 13 offices in eight countries, and we're going to have to open about 20 to 25 more. Uh, we'll certainly be located in Germany, probably in Berlin which I'll announce. Um, Jay Shiat was a very big um, influence uh, for me, certainly Steve Jobs. And Red Burns, who runs the interactive program at NYU, uh, has been a real inspiration. Um, the um, kind of work that we did uh, or do becomes much more um, complicated. Um, and. Uh, and we called what, what we had created during that period of time the Agency for the Digital Age, which we trademarked. Um, this is where we're located. Um, as we start filling in the map, it's because a lot of the clients that we have are uh, global. As even, even clients like Microsoft at one time in their, in their careers were international, and then they became uh, global. There's a very big difference between the two. 
Right now, we see ourselves as an international agency. In the last pitch that we had, which was for MasterCard, we barely made the qualifications to pitch it because we were uh, just uh, international enough to, uh, to, to win that business. I think if we didn't have the offices that we put in place, we wouldn't have been considered. And I think that's going to continue to change. So we want to create a network. But we want it to be very different, and because I'll forget to mention uh, uh, the importance of integration, uh, RGA is fully integrated between all of our offices. And if we work on a client, like let's say Goldman Sachs, we might work on them uh, out of uh, six offices. But seamlessly, we use links, uh, we use um, global crossing, um, we use um, uh, video conferencing is given to everybody in our agency, not just, it doesn't just exist in a conference room, and we're learning how to pull stuff up and work, which gives us the ability to work with less expensive uh, locations like Buenos Aires or um, Bucharest, uh, just simply not because of the people and their creativity, but because of the currency is devalued, which gives us an opportunity to mix lower cost with, um, with, with more costly low locations. We can load balance, which is a more manufacturing term, between offices um, because of uh, how we're set up. And we can work 24-7 because we can be working in New York, but we could also have aspects of what we're doing be, be uh, worked on in Singapore, as an example. That's true integration. Um, we have a staff now that puts us into the same um, kind of uh, size as an AKQA from a digital perspective or a widen in Kennedy. Um, and it's very important to myself that because we're growing organically, we've never had an acquisition or a roll-up. When we open somewhere, we're doing it in order to keep a consistent culture. We want the office to be uh, very true to um, its country and its city but we also want it to be uh, culturally um, um, integrated with uh, what we would consider the RGA DNA. And so um, that's a critical factor in how we're expanding. We have um, in New York, which was never looked at that way, probably the largest creative group in the city. Um, many of our competitors have uh, much smaller teams. We also might be one of the single largest agencies in New York. We're larger now than BBDNO. We're larger than um, uh, YNR uh, or um, uh, McCann Erickson, the big agencies. Uh, and we never attempted to do that. Uh, so it created an, a reason for a restructuring, which is part of the 2013 uh, um, new um, direction, which is to take a couple of ideas. One came from Jay Shiat, how big are you going to get before you get bad? And the other one is, uh, comes from Wall Street, uh, being uh, too big to manage. So we originally um, created these departments, like uh, user experience would be a department, or account management would be a department. Um, and we then created the teams that surrounded uh, um, uh, our clients. And now we've split our agency in New York into eight agencies uh, for the reasons that I just mentioned. Um, but the key when you're going across the uh, eight agencies or when you're going inter-agency is um, something that's always been true of um, things like music and orchestration, things like dance and choreography, is you have to become excellent in this new world at curating the right talent for the right team, uh, for the right pitch team, for the right people to work on the work. And you have to be able to change them out and move them around. So we never see somebody as a FTE, or a so-called full-time equivalent, because nobody's going to be 100%, because the percentages just keep changing. And we've set up a new matrix, which I won't go into in any great detail, but thinking is really the idea of 
uh, people who might be coming at it from the um, con consulting uh, world or from the planning uh, piece or the insights, consumer insights, experience insights, all happen in the think area. And then what's very different than a consultancy uh, is we have to make stuff. And I'll show you a video of what we did on the Nike fuel ban that is different than our entry video for uh, awards. And then we think more importantly, things are gonna change to become more and more important for telling stories that never went away, but it's becoming more and more critical as I mentioned earlier. And then also the ability to be more of an architect so that you can start thinking about how things fit together in an architectural systematic way. So that's our matrix that we work with. And this is sort of our grid. And of new things that we've added, I'll talk about a few of them, but there's one that I just um, added that I didn't have time to put in. And that's actually the idea of um, how we would um, um, uh, work with outside companies. So um, that type of collaboration is really critical because there's so many new companies that have formed that are cloud-based that we want to bring in to our matrix here. And so we're, we were talking about that last night at dinner. Um, it's really the, the, the term that would go at the bottom would be partnerships. And I think that's a very important part of the overall uh, structure that we have. And then how this works with other offices is other offices, let's take London, that's about 150 people. They can add anything that they want to. They could be fully supported, partially supported, or not supported at all and have the resources in, inside. I see a great deal of opportunity in the branding space because of the companies out there, um, Pentagram, Interbrand, um, Landor, Wolf Owens, et cetera, they don't, for some reason or another, really understand the digital landscape. And I think there's a big opportunity for us to integrate brand in with the other things that you saw earlier. Product is a very similar thing. Um, companies like IDO, uh, companies like Frog, and companies um, like um, Eves Behar's Fuse Project, they don't have the complete ability to understand the uh, digital landscape as well as, as RGA is set up to do. I think that's gonna play a, a, a very interesting role in the kinds of products and services we can develop in the future. And uh, consulting is the same thing with uh, Accenture, uh, Forrester, uh, Booz Allen, uh, McKinsey. These are companies that uh, I think what's really critical in all these cases is these are the companies, along with some agencies, that would uh, monopolize the C-suite. But the C-suite has changed dramatically. So we're not just working today with CEOs, CMOs, but also CIOs and CTOs and, it's a, uh, and CFOs. And it's become a very important uh, thing to have a, a, a place in, in, in those um, considerations. In order to do better work, we found that we have to do a different way of selling our work to these uh, C-level clients. And the way that we do it now is uh, I was very influenced by Jeff Bezos, who doesn't allow people to present to him using PowerPoint. And the dreaded PowerPoint or uh, Keynote or um, InDesign, it doesn't really matter. We need a very simplified presentation format combined with a video, because if a picture's worth a thousand words, what if it's moving at 24, 30 frames per second, combined with a new thing that we've just created is a uh, prototype studio, uh, which will grow to about 30 people this year, so that we can create quick prototypes. You have a simple presentation, a video, and a prototype, and I can tell you I believe that's the new um, methodology for selling clients on, on work. So from 2013 on, uh, we looked at uh, creating something that we call functional integration. First one has to understand horizontal integration. 
Coca-Cola is a good example, very good for agencies because they created about 500 brands, which all need agencies, uh, horizontal integration. Um, vertical integration is taking a lot of costs out of the systems of companies by going uh, with a company like ExxonMobil all the way from the ground to a mobile can that might be at a retail uh, situation like a Walmart. And everything that's involved in that uh, supply chain and just-in-time manufacturing, stuff like that, um, was a very big thing um, called uh, vertical integration. Now, functional integration is what I'm going to talk about, what, is what we're doing for the next nine years. It's pretty simple. The consumer's in the center, and you surround them with all sorts of products and services, many of which will be done by agencies or companies like yourself. Um, Apple is a good example. What um, Jobs did is he never saw that complete ecosystem that was created. I can guarantee you that. But what he did see is how these things are interconnected and linked together simply so that they can sell more things to their existing customer. And that's what, why Apple is doing so well. The same thing is true with Google. Um, we worked on Google Wallet, which I'll show you an example of very quickly. Um, uh, but each one of these new products and services um, add to uh, the platform and then subsequently to an ecosystem of value. Same with, um, with Amazon and their newest Kindle Fire, as an example. Um, so these three companies are uh, examples of functionally integrated companies. We tried to do that with Nike, and um, this is, um, these are all things that RGA worked on that created an ecosystem around what Nike calls digital sports. This will show you how it's done. This is the Nike Plus Fuel Band, made to inspire anyone to be more active. It's the result of an intense two-year collaboration with our Nike client that tested the limits of every strategy, design, technology, and marketing capability at RGA. Nike knew it needed to break out of commodity categories like running shoes and find ways to play a larger role in the lives of consumers. They had a head start. With Nike Plus, Nike and RGA had devised a system to seamlessly transmit data from runners to a website and out to social networks. As Nike Plus became an obsession for over 7 million runners who share and compare results an average of three times a week, Nike was already looking ahead to a wearable device that could record, measure, and share all activity, powered by Nike Plus. With this insight that measurement equals motivation, how can we create an experience for the everyday athlete? We began with a story that explained what this new device could be and how it would stand out from every other product in the marketplace. Can you count, suckers? There was one word, one idea that summed it up. Everything you do counts. This would become the basis for the campaign that eventually introduced the device to the world. Meanwhile, we devised a process for managing the simultaneous development of the platform, the product, and its branding. We called this way of working vertical slicing. Our core team was small and nimble with cross-functional capabilities. On any given day, one group might be working on how the band syncs with mobile. Another group might be working on the unboxing experience. We tracked our progress on collaborative demo days with the Nike team. The product demos created a feedback loop, and working software became the measure of progress. Everyone could see where we stood, see where we had to go, and enter each new cycle of development with clear goals. Experimenting with algorithms, we began tracking every type of activity with a universal system of measurement called Fuel. It was revolutionary in its consistency, useful as a metric in a way that calories, which get burned at varying rates depending on body type, are not. And we started testing the flow of data to Nike Plus. We've built it to be a motivational game. Getting to your goal every day is the core part of the experience. To demonstrate how the social component of Fuel could work, a small team quickly wrote sample code that established proof of concept. 
The social part is actually what keeps it really sticky. It's kind of that competition that keeps you coming back. Anyone who you're friends with on Facebook will be in your leaderboard. From the beginning, Nike Plus Fuel Band was meant to change behavior, to get people to do more, and it has. From the moment they put it on in the morning to the time they go to sleep, users are constantly interacting with the fuel band and the service that drives it. They're sharing more, talking about the brand more, and ultimately spending more on Nike products. Fuel has fundamentally changed Nike's business, from a company that makes shoes to one that helps you achieve your goals, from a product manufacturer to a functionally integrated system of value for consumers. Nike has this saying, if you have a body, you are an athlete, and now this is finally coming true. This is the Nike Plus Fuel Band. So, <laughs> so th this was our way in which to move into branding, consulting, uh, product innovation, um, as well as data visualization, which is a new department. Uh, it'll move into 3D printing, which is going to be, which was the biggest thing that I saw at the South by Southwest convention uh, just recently. And, and, and so it is that we continue to innovate around different things. This is a, if I could have a little bit louder uh, on the audio. Um, this year, the wallet became more than a wallet, and the way we pay changed forever. Google Wallet came from the idea that shoppers needed access to more information. Google Wallet platform combines credit cards, loyalty cards, and offers into one place so you always have them with you. To develop this new payment platform, Google asked us to help design, brand, and create the user experience around the wallet. First, we named it. From there, we developed the wallet identity that showed how the product behaves. We also branded other wallet-related products, creating a suite of brands for the Google Commerce platform. To launch Google Wallet to the world, we created not just a normal press event, but an interactive experience that demonstrates a product. To build buzz, we took a classic Seinfeld clip and gave it a googly twist. And to promote trial in the real world, we created the first ever tapping spree at the American Eagle flagship store in Times Square. What's really exciting about this is it's just the beginning. So the, the key there is a company like Google, we're working on the branding, we're also working on the naming, and then we're working on the user experience for something as important as the mobile uh, currency. So it's, it's, a, it's a direction that if you have the right parts and pieces, you could be very effective in, in that area. Here's another example, hopefully. Getty Images is known as the world's largest source of stock media, available for people to search and buy online. But people don't look for media this way anymore. They're used to content coming to them in streams, in real time, wherever they are. So to transform the way people experience Getty Images, we created a utility called The Feed. The Feed identifies topics that are trending on Twitter and listens specifically for words and phrases being used a lot so we can match the most relevant image with the real-time conversation and automatically publish the perfect picture to Facebook. For example, in September 2012, Real Madrid played Manchester City in the Football Champions League. The feed monitored conversation around the game. Cristiano Ronaldo scored for Real in the last minute and won the match for the Spanish team. The event was trending on Twitter, but this moment caused a spike in activity and provided us with the intelligence to identify the perfect image to publish on our sports Facebook timeline. It was no coincidence that the image sourced by the feed in real time was exactly the same as the one featured on the back pages the next morning. For people, the feed provides relevant streams of content featuring the biggest stories and the most notable moments from the worlds of sports, news, and entertainment as they happen. For brands, a subscription to the feed allows them to automate their social publishing using some of the world's best media. 
and for Getty Images, their brand now fits into people's everyday lives while also providing them with a new source of revenue. The Feed by Getty Images, a simple innovation that makes a brand relevant again. So what's important here is that we're not just working on um, motion imaging, um, print, uh, uh, and also outdoor, but we've actually started to work on ideas that can actually change a company's business. And that requires that you work at the sea level, and then that requires that you have a consulting capability uh, combined with a real uh, cup insights into not just um, consumer behavior, uh, big data, but also into uh, the fundamental user experience of their customers. The last thing that I'm going to show you um, is very short. We started to work with Ron Johnson, who founded the, um, the Apple stores for, um, for uh, um, he created the Apple retail stores, and then he started to work at JCPenney, and we just ran out of uh, runway because Ron got managed out. We wish that we had worked with them sooner. But this is a good example of where I think TV is going. Very short, because it's 15 second spots, and they're talking about a demonstration of a product and service, in this case, a product and price. So I, I wanted to show that that's the last thing that, that I'll talk about. Um, because what I really believe in is I believe that the part of the TV commercial production that relates to metaphors is going to give way to creative, and I'm not saying this is the best version, creative ver versions of showing products and services, which goes back to the ecosystem that I was talking about and demonstrating how they work or what they do or why they're important to, to, to you. And that type of demonstration, I think, will, will be the future of um, storytelling as it relates to commercial production. Uh, two years ago at Cannes, I went in and I actually took note of the gold winners that were shown at the Grand Palais how many were um, metaphors, how many were metaphors and demonstrations, and how many were pure demonstrations, like an iPhone, uh, iPad uh, ad. And 95% of everything that won gold was 100% uh, metaphor. And that's why I think that's going to change, because things are moving to ecosystems around products and services, and it lends itself to a demonstration. So um, thank you very much. Um, and I think I'm going to do some questions with Michael Conrad. <laughs> <laughs>